So um, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Denise. Um, he is an associate professor at Imperial College London. He is a um, recipient of many awards, including an Early Achievement Award of the IEEE Communication Society and Best Paper Awards at IEEE Wireless Communications and Networking Conference. Um, he has been recently working a lot on um, at, at the intersection of machine learning and wireless, a lot of interesting work, starting from coding, channel coding, and joint source channel coding, pilot design, channel estimation, and all the way to mobile edge computing and federated learning more recently. So today he is going to tell us about machine learning at the wireless network edge. Thank you. Thank you very much. So do you get to see my screen? Because I, I do you see it? OK, so machine yeah. learning at the wireless end. Perfect. OK, so thanks a lot, uh, Hieji, for the, the introduction and, of course, for, for invitation. And apologies again for this <laughs> delay. I should have been a bit uh, more careful about that. OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, um, kind of connections between you know, machine learning and uh, wireless communications. So as he as you mentioned, so we are working in my group quite a lot on, you know, some, you know, different uh, interaction synergies between the two, basically. And I mean, in, uh, I think uh, the I know that in uh, your group, uh, a lot of work is going on. And so in my head, you know, we can kind of categorize these into two different aspects, you know, one is basically using machine learning to somehow improve uh, wireless communication systems. And on the other hand, it's uh, somehow using uh, designing communication systems to, to enable uh, communications, uh, to enable machine learning across wireless devices. So we, we actually work on uh, both aspects in my group. So uh, we've been doing, uh, looking into different problems in, in both areas. But today I thought, you know, like I will talk about more on the, the second part. So more kind of how do we do machine learning at the wireless edge? Okay. Okay. So obviously, you know, uh, I mean, I will go over this kind of, I think the, the, the introductory part, which is quite obvious to, to this uh, particular audience, but uh, let me do that anyway, to give a brief introduction. Okay. So we know the, the, the main kind of, uh, the reasons behind the, the success of machine learning algorithms. So massive data sets and of course, uh, uh, big uh, computation power and, and which enabled basically us to, to, to be able to train, you know, more and more complex models. Uh, and now if we look at uh, now the, the results recent years, so the complexity of models are of course, you know, growing like, uh, uh, crazy. So it now it's becoming clear that even in a kind of a data center type of uh, domain, so it's impossible to actually, you know, uh, even with the state of the art computational resources, we cannot, you know, do training of, you know, learning of these models on a single machine. So we, it's, it's ine inevitable that we have to somehow distribute these machine learning uh, tasks. Uh, Okay, so if we now move to more to the to the wireless setting, so uh, so in the machine learning industry, people are already looking at distributed machine learning techniques, but now if we move to the more the the wireless scenario, uh, what we have is that we have both the uh, the data distributed, of course, all these IoT devices collecting data, but also the computational resources. And moreover, of course, we have the kind of these additional uh, limitations of uh, wireless connections. So what we need kind of to, to, to be able to enable a real kind of distributed intelligence across these edge devices is to basically, uh, basically what I say is that to bring the intelligence to the edge because you know the, the kind of the conventional approach to this uh, problem is to basically bring the data to the to a kind of central location, which of course introduces uh, lots of problems, uh, starting from latency, of course, and and privacy, and of course we have limited bandwidth and power across these devices, and so on and so forth. So basically, the, the idea uh, here that in this talk I will you know talk about so how we can do. Uh, as much as possible, both the, the training and also inference uh, at the wireless uh, closer to the edge. 
Okay, so the, what I'm going to be promoting is a somehow a joint uh, machine learning and communication paradigm. So the main argument that kind of uh, uh, of the talk is that so currently what we are trying to do is to you know we are designing machine learning algorithms and we have been designing communication protocols and now we're kind of trying to put these two together to to so that you know they work together and the the kind of the general approach is to uh, to optimize the two parameters of the two so to, to kind of get the best result but uh, what I will be arguing is that actually you know we need something something more we need something deeper we actually need to design these things together jointly to get really the, the benefits and actually in many cases that is required to to be able to enable uh, lots many of the machine learning tasks that are very kind of uh, sensitive to latency or uh, or cannot be sustained with the, within the spectrum and power resources of IoT devices. Okay, so as I said, I will kind of you know group these into two uh, different uh, problems. So uh, one of them is the distributed inference problem. So here the assumption is that somehow you know I, I am able to train uh, a machine learning algorithm or uh, a communication uh, system, and now I, I will just kind of use it to to infer uh, from data. Uh, so basically here the assumption is that I can train whatever I want beforehand. And I'm more interested in the, the inference uh, stage. And of course, also the, the distributed training. So I will try to talk about uh, both of these problems. OK, so now the distributed inference. So uh, OK, so we know how to train you know, models and then infer uh, in a centralized setting, right? So if, we, if I have the data, I can train something, and then I can embed it on a, in a mobile device, whatever. And then do the do the inference, but you know there are many cases, at, particularly at the edge, that this kind of local inference is not possible. So so when will, would this be the case? So the the import the one uh, important example is, for example, when the decisions may rely on data that is not available at the device. So for example, if you want to do some uh, some detection on a mobile. Uh, on a car, uh, autonomous car, etc., and maybe this uh, the the accurate decision depends on information, maybe the terrain information that's available on the uh, base station. Okay, or you know a, another case where the local uh, inference may not be possible is when the of course the device is limited in terms of processing capability. So of course the, in this case latency becomes a major challenge. So we need to make these decisions very quickly, especially in the case of, for example, safe self-driving cars. And uh, so now the question is: so how much, uh, how can we do this uh, communication part such that you know we can actually uh, meet the requirements of this type of uh, inference? Okay, so we first looked at this problem uh, from a fundamental information theoretic perspective. So we model this kind of obviously it's not uh, uh, really representative of a machine learning problem but the kind of the closest uh, kind of and uh, information theory formulation that is also uh, let's say solvable was the hypothesis testing over noisy channels so let's assume now i have some observer observing some samples and i have a detector which needs to make a decision and our and we, we our decisions are in the sense of you know uh, deciding which is the underlying distribution of uh, these samples are coming from. And let's look at the simplest case, the binary hypothesis testing. And we have a noisy channel in between. So now I'm observing and I need to send my somehow some uh, function of my observations to the de detector over this noisy channel. And the question is like, okay, so what is the, the best thing we can do? Now, in this case, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of intuitive that uh, unless we impose some constraints on the observer, as I said, some complexity constraints, which is typically difficult to do in the for in an information theory formulation, we expect that you know, the optimal will be to make the decision locally and then send that decision over the channel. But basically we want to show this, uh, uh, prove this. And here we look at the type two error exponent uh, and under this kind of constraints on the, uh, on the bandwidth. So you can use the channel, let's say some, uh, times per uh, source sample so it and it's not 
uh, very difficult, but you know, uh, going through this, uh, the proof, you can actually show that the best error exponent depends on you know this uh, the the divergence between the two distributions and you know uh, the channel error exponent, uh, the minimum of the two. Okay, but the, the kind of the more interesting case is uh, when you cannot actually do the decision locally at the, the, the observer. And, and that can happen, as I said, when some information is available only at the detector, okay? So for example, in this case, let's say the observer observes UK samples and the detector has the VK samples and the, what we are trying to do test is the joint distribution, okay? So we want to decide if the joint distribution is from coming from P uh, joint distribution UV or the distribution Q. Now, in this case, this is more interesting because the observer now sends, has to send some uh, kind of summary of its observations to the detector to allow the best possible decision. And in this case, interestingly, we were able to show, uh, to prove the, the optimal performance in, in terms of this uh, error exponents, type two error exponents under a constraint on the type one uh, error probability. Uh, in, a, in a single letter, this information theoretic form, and when we are testing against independence, okay, so and uh, but that but in general, when it's testing against arbitrary joint distribution, we cannot uh, have a kind of we can we don't know the optimal uh, performance, but we can prove that separation is sub strictly suboptimal in the sense that uh, what we uh, so it, so in the testing against independence. The optimal performance, actually, if you look at it, depends on separately the, the source parameters, what we observe is U and V, and the channel. So it, it, it depends to the channel, uh, uh, on the channel only through its capacity. So it, there's, there is sort of a separation, like in the case of joint source channel coding. But this separation fails in the general case. So in general, when you are doing some sort of uh, hypothesis testing uh, remotely, uh, so the separate source and channel coding is uh, suboptimal but the, the problem is open in general. So this is uh, the kind of the theoretical problem. What we then said, okay, so what is the, the practical, uh, what would be the practical problem that uh, we can use kind of this, what uh, this kind of uh, formulation is, uh, so we, we came up with this image retrieval uh, problem. This actually this one of the kind of, uh, problems that came out really kind of a research discussion, which is difficult these days with a uh, colleague of mine uh, working on machine vision. So they were actually trying to do really like observe, uh, they had a project where they were trying to uh, install cameras in, in Africa where they would kind of record uh, animals that are approaching the cameras and then detect if there's a certain kind of uh, type of animal which needed to be kind of uh, uh, detected, then they would kind of, uh, uh, notify the the, the 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 local observers, and then they would need to go there and maybe check the animal, etc. So, but but he said basically they, they couldn't manage to do this, and the main reason was that basically they, because these were satellite links, the ca link capacity was not enough for them to send good quality image to make detection. And and basically, so this is exactly the type of problem that okay, so you are taking an image from the camera, you want to detect if that image belongs to some element in your data set, but these images are, the, the data set images are taken by different cameras. Uh, so you need to do so, some sort of image retrieval and there's a noisy channel in between. Okay, so we, we looked at, uh, so this is, we use this particular data set of uh, human images and then, you know, uh, we're trying to detect pedestrians. Uh, okay, so in this case, so we, we looked into, uh, two possible approaches. So the, the standard approach is that, you know, let's try to send the image using the state-of-the-art image compression scheme and then whatever the best kind of channel transmission scheme and try to use this, the, again, the state-of-the-art image retrieval uh, algorithms. And it turns out that this is terrible. So as my friend, my colleague uh, had, had already experienced that, so it doesn't work. So what we need to do instead, obviously, is that you need to, you should not compress your image as if you know you just want to reconstruct the image because you don't want to reconstruct the image. You want to do, use that image for retrieval. So instead, you you need to kind of get the features that are useful for retrieval and then compress those to the available capacity of your channel. 
So basically, now we design this quantization part together with the, the entropy, the arithmetic encoder. But now we, we basically train everything together. So we're kind of the feature encoding together with this kind of uh, this compression part. And uh, then we, you do the uh, classification, which is basically the nearest neighbor type of detect, uh, retrieval at the receiver. So this is in a way, so the, the first approach here is that is a retrieval oriented image compression scheme using uh, deep neural networks. But we said, okay, so this we can do even better. Why? Because from our fundamental information theoretic uh, results, we know that separation is not optimal in general, <clears throat> even, in, uh, even asymptotically. So we know that in, in general, you know, for finite block lengths, separation fails, even for joints or channel coding. But at least if you have large block lengths, it, it should be near optimal. But we, we saw that in this problem, that's not even the case. So we said, okay, let's then we, we should do some sort of joint uh, feature encoding and channel coding. So we also basically used our kind of previous work on deep joints or channel coding for image transmission. But here again, the goal is not to transmit images, but to do retrieval. So here basically we are training now the re-identification baseline, so it's, uh, typically based on ResNet, the feature encoding and mapping this feature directly into channel symbols. And at the receiver, we are doing feature decoding and uh, classification based on the noisy channel outputs and then training all, all this uh, kind of jointly. So we are using some uh, uh, three-step training process. And here are some results. So using the C CUHK uh, data set. So you can see as a function of the SNR and uh, the top one accuracy, and we have some uh, limited channel users. So basically this is for AWGN channel and using the channel only 120 uh, eight symbols. And you can see that, so this is the green curve is what you would get uh, digital approach, but but it's not digital approach where in the sense, you know, sending the image and then doing retrieval. It's the digital approach that using our retrieval oriented image compression scheme combined with capacity achieving channel code compared to, you know, the two curves. So here the, the joint uh, sort channel coding type of like, uh, feature encoding approach uh, basically is much better. So there are these two different approaches, but basically it's just a uh, different complexity uh, JSCC schemes. And moreover, actually you can see that even after basically uh, five dB channel, we are almost getting the, the baseline performance as if you know, we have all the features uh, locally. So this is uh, basically kind of an example. Yeah, so, so sure. Yeah, this model, so is, is this like a symbol by symbol type? I mean, you have code, I guess, but um, you're so, not packetizing the image or, no, I, or anything so like that. I, right? I take an image. So the, the image, the dimensions, basically this 250, 628 image, each image comes in, goes through some, you know, like a neural network processing. And then what comes out is like 128 channel symbols. So whatever, you know, like you do in between is up to you. And, and using those 128 channel AWGN channel outputs with this SNRs values, you then reconstruct the image. So in our joint source channel coding approach, because there's no code, nothing. So in a way that's packetized, but you know, this pack is, you know, is one image transmitted over one block of this uh, 128 symbols. I see, okay. Um, Denise, which code are you, are you using for the uh, digital? For the di so this is capacity achieving. I look at the channel capacity. I don't, I'm not even using code. I'm using, I'm using the Shannon capacity. So I'm assuming with 128 symbols, you are achieving the Shannon capacity, which is obviously not the case. So I'm super, you know, lenient to the digital approach. And yet the, this is the gap. This is just to show that. And actually, I mean, we wanted to include the, the results for the case when you would send the image using you know, BPG compression with the capacity channel code. It just doesn't fit in this figure. It's so bad. <laughs> it's, it's not, you know, you need basically 50, 60 dB to get reasonable yeah. accuracies. Okay. So, so this is kind of to show that, you know, how much you can actually gain. I mean, we knew that, you know, like source channel, joint source channel coding is good in general, right? So you can gain from that. But I guess, you know, when you want to reconstruct the image, the gain is a bit less what you can gain. Whereas when, when you go to this kind of detection, you know, like type of, you know, inference type of problems, the gains are even more significant. 
and that's actually one of my kind of arguments that I think, you know, like maybe in the near future, if you really want to push this towards edge, edge intelligence, do this kind of, you know, over wireless channels, I think it's an unavoidable that we will have to kind of combine this, uh, the learning and the, the channel coding. I think this kind of strict separation is, is, is not going to be sufficient anymore. Okay, so then uh, we looked at, so I, uh, maybe I will, let me check how I'm doing in terms of time. Yeah, so we, we also looked at the problem when, you know, uh, I was mentioning before that, uh, so normally you could do the, 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 the detection, the inference locally, but maybe because of the complexity reasons you cannot, right? So your device cannot run too many uh, operations. Maybe it's, it's, it doesn't have a GPU, it doesn't, it's not, uh, and uh, enough processing power. So the typical approach to this is that, so we want to run maybe, you know, one of these complex uh, deep neural networks. So what uh, is done is that you, you split it into two, you run only the first few layers at the device, then you transmit uh, what you get, the, the features to the, to the uh, server, edge server, and then the rest are run at the edge server, assuming that the edge server has uh, much much more capability. If you look at now here, for example, the the data size that you need to transmit as you go across the layers. So in typical these kind of uh, deep neural network models, first it kind of the network first enlarges, so you get more and more data, and then kind of compresses. So actually, if you do like only few layers, after few layers you might end up actually sending even more data. Uh, and then, you know, like may, maybe later, but this will then later it reduces, but then it, this means that you will need to run more local. And people said, okay, so, but maybe we should actually, instead of sending all the data, just, you know, like maybe using like 32 bits per uh, uh, element, we can actually compress those. And, and they were using things like, for example, JPEG compression, because in, in the case of for typical image, uh, machine vision type of applications, of course, these filter outputs are, kind of images, uh, not, not exact images, but uh, but then of course, again, the, the same comes the same argument that normally what we want to do is not to reconstruct those. And even though, even though they might look like images, maybe our goal is not to reconstruct them. So typical image compression schemes should not be uh, good. So again, we looked at in this case, you know, like with uh, basically limited complexity at the encoder, uh, so what can I do if I'm using kind of uh, this joint source channel coding type of uh, approach? And, and now what we will do is we will also prune the network to reduce the complexity at the encoder. And here are some examples. So, uh, so this, uh, the two examples, so the, uh, so the bottleneck is the one that just uh, uses some compression scheme and uh, sends the compressed uh, information after running some few layers. So Bottlenet uh, plus plus uh, use, used actually our deep JSCC scheme, uh, but but now on top of that we are using pruning, and the the, the JSCC scheme, and we we can see that basically we have huge amounts of gains. So if if you look at like on device uh, computation, and a you know for function of the ch required channel bandwidth, and here basically for for a target accuracy level. So we can we can see that you know we can really reduce the required bandwidth orders of magnitude with the same with a very you know uh, even at very low kind of uh, on device computation requirements. Okay, so uh, now I will uh, switch to the the training problem. Okay, so the in distributed training. As I said, now the, the, the models are growing, so we definitely need to exploit uh, many more devices jointly to, to, to learn from uh, data. So there are two typical kind of lines of research in this. So one of them is more the uh, data center type of approach where basically you have the data, but, but you want to use more kind of distributed workers that are you know, dedicated workers for the, the learning. And so how should I allocate the data to the workers and what kind of communications I should use, et cetera. So there is a line of research here also mainly originating from also co uh, coding and com communication theory people, which uh, we have also done some work. 
is mainly targeting straggler mitigation. So because of these workers uh, may not be homogeneous, so they might be, you know, some of them might be uh, having delays, uh, random delays at some, uh, sometimes they might be basically uh, slower than usual. Uh, and in that case, since you have the data centrally, you can actually introduce some redundancy to your uh, this distributed computations through coding to compensate for regular servers. So, but this is more a centralized approach. So you have the data centrally, so you can encode it and then send assign coded data to the workers. Whereas the, the other kind of setting is more the federated learning setting. So in federated learning, the data is already distributed, which is more appropriate, I would say, for the kind of this uh, edge applications. And now you want to use the data that is already distributed at the devices to train a common model. Now, uh, of course, this is now a very, very popular uh, research area, but uh, kind of to highlight the, the distinction between the way we look at it and maybe the way it's uh, commonly studied in the, the machine learning literature is that, so we are now looking at uh, federated learning at the wireless edge in the sense, for example, these devices could be IoT devices that are co-located and now they want to train uh, a net model with the help of this uh, edge server over the same wireless medium. So now, uh, we also need to design this wireless communication part. Okay, so uh, this is just a very you know, one slide summary of uh, distributed learning. So typically, so we have these uh, local data sets, uh, examples with uh, typically labeled uh, data set uh, at each device. So we want to solve basically this optimization problem for some uh, loss function L. And uh, typically this is solved by gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. So what happens is that, so at each iteration, so we have a global model that we send to all the devices. Each device takes the, finds the gradient based on its uh, local data set. So it's an estimate of the, the gradient and they return their gradient estimates to the, to the uh, to the parameter server where they are averaged and then the model is updated. Now, uh, so there are many different versions of this, but uh, this is the, the general idea. So now in the case of uh, distributed or federated learning, of course, communication is always a bottleneck, whether it's wireless or not. And there are many, many methods. There's a huge literature on, you know, communication efficient uh, distributed learning or federated learning. I think we can classify the approaches into these kind of three categories. So one of them is uh, compression. So now you're sending these gradients or model updates, uh, so, but in, you know, these are of course huge, uh, can be huge depending on the model that we are training. So how can we reduce, you know, how can we send as few bits as possible for each of these updates? And typical approaches with QSGD, sign SGD. So what's used is, you know, to quantize these updates into as few bits as possible. The second approach is sparsification. The idea is to, you know, instead of sending all the updates, uh, only send the most significant entries. So it's mostly, you know, you look at the, 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 the entries with the, the highest uh, absolute values and send maybe uh, down to, you know, 0 0.1 to 1% 1 uh, of those values. And interestingly, those are actually sufficient to, to train a reasonable model. Another approach is to uh, increase more the, the local computations. For example, you can increase the, the batch sizes or a more common approach is to do uh, what's called a local SGD. So you do multiple local iterations basically. So based on your local data, so instead of every time finding the gradient, uh, the gradient uh, estimate, uh, local gradient estimate back to the uh, server after every uh, SGD iteration, instead you do multiple iterations, update the model and up send your model update. Okay, so now we uh, looked at this, uh, this, this sparsification approach. So the idea here is that each worker, basically you can consider this as returning to the, the uh, parameter server, a mask version of its update, right? So you have a mask, which is just a binary mask. And so you, you kind of, uh, 
multiply element wise with your gradient, local gradient estimate and send that uh, mask version. So you are removing uh, some of the elements basically. Now the most common approach is top K sparsification. So what, what it means that each worker constructs its own mask based on the, the largest absolute values of its own gradients. So now this requires, of course, in addition to, so you're reducing a lot the, the number of elements that you are sending. Uh, but of course, since you, you decide your mask locally, you also need to send your mask to the uh, parameter server. So which means that you need to send uh, K log 2D bits, you know, to, to encode the, I mean, there can be some different more efficient encodings uh, of this, but in principle, basically you need to also send your mask. And uh, another limitation of this is that, you know, uh, you need to use uh, gather operation rather than the reduce operation. So meaning that, you know, now you can, you're not just, you know, these, since they are not the same mask across, you know, you need to also uh, take, get each one and then uh, uh, add them up. So it's in a way, it's a, uh, a bit less efficient. And of course, you know, once they get all these mask versions at the, the parameter server, the, the overall model may not be sparse. But this means that next time when the parameter server broadcasts the model to the users, now it, it's, it's not necessi necessarily a sparse model. Now, in parallel, there is this literature on network pruning, right? So the, the idea there, uh, I guess, uh, Everybody is somehow familiar with that, which I already mentioned without really explaining uh, the details of that. But so the assumption is that, you know, for most of these kind of uh, complex models, we can actually remove many of the weights and without really hurting the, the final performance. So the, the typical, the, the way it is done is that we, you know, we first train a full model, we take a full, uh, fully trained model and gradually remove less important uh, parameters of that model, either the filters or the, uh, the parameters and to, to, have, to end up with a much, much, you know, uh, low complexity model. Now there is a, uh, this paper that lottery ticket hypothesis, the idea here is this says that basically, so dense networks could contain some uh, sparse subnetworks, which they uh, call as these winning tickets, which actually when, if they were trained in isolation rather than kind of starting from the fully trained network, they would actually reach the accuracy comparable to the, to the full network to fully trained. So, so in a way, you know, uh, the goal should, you know, if, if we knew from the very beginning, what is that uh, sparse network structure, we didn't even need to uh, train a larger network. So now, so basically that is kind of uh, also, you know, like motivated this our uh, uh, scheme, which we call it time correlated sparsification for distributed uh, federated learning. So the motivation is that, so if there is this underlying sparse model that, you know, we, we should be able to get at the end. So, so then, you know, like this means that the, the important weights should not be changing significantly over iterations. And if possible, you know, when we find that we should be able to stick to that kind of that sparsity, which is this kind of uh, the mask. So for that, for uh, in our uh, model, so the each worker employs two masks. One of the, one of them is the global mask and the local mask. So now the uh, the global model update. So they uh, users receive. So then uh, to this global uh, mask, then uh, uh, applied into this global model update, which is just the top K sparsification and then each worker recovers updates the model okay so each worker you know tracks the the model and then they they apply their local iterations based on the local data set some, some number of sgd updates and then they use sparsify using uh the global but uh they don't you know the now they don't need to send the, the locality information because the, the sparsity remains the same, right? So because they are using the, this, everybody is using the same uh, global uh, mask, which is also known by the master server. But of course, you know, if we all just use the, the global uh, model, we are, we're gonna be stuck in the same kind of sparse model. So there's no way to, you know, uh, try different elements. So, so now we introduce a kind of the exploration dimension to that. So everybody on top of the globally masked version 
then they send some extra, but a much smaller number of parameters, which is masked through this M local K uh, parameter uh, mask. So now this is basically, you send the top K, you know, based on the global and add a few kind of exploratory elements based that are locally, you see that they are locally important. So this, this kind of allows us to, you know, like uh, both, you know, explore new parameters, but also keep this kind of local, uh, the, the structure and then which uh, significantly reduces the communication requ requirements. Okay, so here are some results. So here, uh, so basically we have, of course, now this scheme can be combined with other also, you know, like uh, schemes where you can do local iterations, different number of, and then you can also add uh, quantization, etc. So now compared to, you know, like this, for example, top K, we are getting both uh, much better accuracy, but also almost like 2000 times reduction in the communication load. Okay, so thanks to this, you know, uh, in a way, I mean, this is again, like a little bit motivated from, you know, the way looking at this problem from an information theoretic uh, formulation, because in the end, every time the data that we are sending has some memory in it, right? We are not sending completely new information. So we wanted to use, you know, like this, this memory, somehow find a way to use this memory and basically using this, you know, uh, fixing the uh, keeping uh, track of the a global model and like slowly changing only based on the local variables that allowed us to basically gain significant uh, reduction in the communication load. And of also, I, I should mention that uh, for those of you who are working on this, so this, this can also be used uh, momentum. Uh, so that's also, you know, you, we get even better uh, accuracies in, in incorporating momentum. Okay, so now I have uh, quite <laughs> little time actually, like getting less and less that I just came to the, the federated edge learning part, but okay, so let's see how much I can cover. So the idea here, as I was saying, uh, so everybody has their own uh, local data sets and instead of, you know, uh, sending the data to the center, so we will use this distributed training as before. Uh, okay, so, so now uh, what I call uh, feel is the federated edge learning. So the difference than uh, federated learning, so the, what I talked previously was basically general in any kind of distributed federated learning setting, didn't have any kind of particular the wireless aspects. Whereas in fire, uh, federated edge learning, the main uh, co important component is also the fact that these devices are connecting to uh, wireless links. So one of the things that, you know, like uh, we looked at is that so okay? Normally, you know, like if if you want to do this wireless federated learning, so the devices have to all connect to the this uh, parameter server, which is typically a base station now, and uh, and of course we need to now allocate the resources, the channel resources, to all these devices, so they all kind of divide. And and you, normally, what you would like is to make sure that every device is able to send their updates, especially in the case of uh, non-IID data their distributions. But then of course this will give, you know, uh, you will be limited by typically the cell edge users. And we know how to, you know, deal with these kind of problems in communication. So we can, if we can, for example, introduce some hierarchical uh, heterogeneous network structure. So by introducing some small base stations. So here the idea is that, so we, we, we form now these smaller clusters where the users communicate with their uh, small base station more often, so they use maybe just, you know, stochastic gradient updates and then locally learn a model. And only once in a while, they update the base station, the global model at the base station. So in a way you can think of it as, so locally we are using just S, the, the uh, classical SGD updates, whereas uh, with the base station now we are updating after many local iterations. So it's more like a federated averaging type of approach, but the, the local updates are still done not at one device, but actually uh, uh, locally within that uh, small cell. So here, of course, uh, and of course, this also allows us now, not only because of this kind of local training and updates because of the hierarchical st structure of the federated learning, but also mainly from the communication, because now we can do uh, frequency reuse and, you know, like then they, they can gain much more in terms of uh, transmission power, so on and so forth. So here we can see, for example, compared to uh, the centralized federated learning. 
So this hierarchical federated learning allows us to do, you know, we can do much more local literacy. So much less updates with the uh, base station and still get, you know, uh, very good levels of accuracy. Okay, so then uh, we looked at, you know, uh, so the problem here, so in, in the previous work, we were trying to kind of schedule all the devices. But of course, you know, normally, if you, I mean, we know from wireless that we should not be uh, try to schedule all the devices. That's not necessarily uh, a best use of resources. So, so let's now try to do, you know, federated learning. Let's say you have M devices, but every time you will schedule only some subset of them, let's say K of them. But the question is now, how do we schedule these devices, right? So because we know in wireless communications that we typically maximize throughput or whatever. And for example, what you would do, you would just give the channel to the best uh, users and that would uh, typically maximize the, the, the rate. And maybe you might introduce some uh, fairness constraints. So here we look at, we said, okay, so I mean, uh, the scheme, the, this scheme would be the BC best channel. So we could just allocate to the best or what we could do, we could also look at, so uh, normally, of course, we want to allocate, you know, like schedule the user, which has the most important update, right? So whose update is gonna help us in terms of learning. And for that, we use a proxy, the, the L2 node, okay? So the, the, the larger the L2 norm of the local update, we assume that that's kind of, that's, of course, that's gonna somehow impact more the, the global model. So instead, we can basically schedule users based on their L2 norm. So this assumes, of course, that first, this L2 norm, you know, there's two-phase communication. So they sent their L2 norms instead of their channel states, maybe. And we can uh, schedule based on that. The third approach is best channel, best L2 norm. So what we basically do is kind of try to combine these two here. So we first choose KC, you know, top KC based only on the channels but then among those, so basically this eliminates the users with the really bad channels. And then from those, we schedule the K best in terms of their L2 norms. And then when we get this, we, we, we still need to allocate the bandwidth. So we allocate the bandwidth such that everybody can transmit the same amount of information. And then the, the last scheme is the best L2 norm channel. So here is basically based on the channel. So here, uh, the idea is that Okay, so uh, so in the previous schemes, what, after once we decide on whom to schedule, as I said, now we still need to allocate the resources, right? So because I have only certain amount of channel resources, now we allocate them such that each user can transmit the same amount of information. And once they have, they know how much they can transmit, then they still have to compress their local models to that level so that they can upload. So in the end, you know, I might be scheduling a user which has huge L2 norm, but then in the end, after, you know, maybe it has so little resources, it ends up getting so little resources that it has to quantize it so small that, you know, it's not anymore large L2 norm. So this last scheme basically kind of tries to avoid that where we, each user looks at its own channel and then assumes that it's gonna be allocated all the bandwidth then does the compression and looks at the L2 norm of this reduced model. And then, you know, we schedule them based on that. So this kind of avoids that uh, issue. And now if you look at the, the results, so what we observe that, not surprisingly, so this last scheme uh, does the best. But one kind of interesting observation here is that for, you know, we, we try different number of kind of scheduling different number. So here we have uh, 40 devices. Uh, it turns out actually it's, it's best to schedule a single user, but this is under IID data distribution. Okay, so, you know, it's best actually to choose one user, give the best resources and to kind of, you know, like allow it to, to send a, a, a reliable update so that, you know, it's the fastest uh, learning. But then, you know, to choose that one, we should basically look at both the, the updates. So it should be both update aware, also the channel review. Okay, so I should also mention that, so I, I don't have it here, but it's in the paper that, so this is not so much the case if you have non-IID data, which is also very interesting because in the case of non-IID data, of course, you, you don't wanna get just from the one, you know, it's better to get actually from more devices. Uh, so you might need to schedule more uh, in that case. So now I want to uh, briefly also mention something that 
again, I mean, uh, it's kind of reinforcing my initial arguments of this uh, combining physical layer with the machine learning approach. So in this uh, federated edge learning problem, so the, 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 um, the real problem is actually, so what we have is that, so we have these devices scheduling or not scheduling, whatever in the end. So we have a certain number of devices trying to send these model updates, whatever they are, some you know vectors of real numbers over a multiple access channel, right? But then at the receiver, what we really want is the average or the sum of these model updates. Right? So we don't really care about individual updates. So this is actually a problem of uh, computation over a multiple access channel. And again, we know from information theoretic results is that there's no separation in that case. And uh, so instead of basically using these digital approaches that I've been talking about so far, where basically you are assigned some channel resources and then you somehow reduce your model into the, the uh, communication capacity allowed through that uh, allocated channel resources, through quantization, sparsification, whatever. So instead, we should actually look at, you know, do uh, somehow jointly, you know, source channel coding in a way, but it's again, not really joint source channel coding. The goal is to uh, join source channel coding computation. Okay, so the, 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 the uh, method we propose, this analog distributed gradient descent is that, so the, the workers, uh, or the devices, so they have their gradient updates. So now what they do, they first sparsify them. So because, I mean, these, these gradient updates are huge, right? So I need to somehow, you know, but the, maybe the bandwidth resources are much less. So in, when I do digital, it's nice because I can, I can do quantization, whatever compression, so I can really compress it to whatever the, you know, how many bits you allow me to. But now I will do some analog transformation. So I won't do any compress. So I get the vector and I, I want to map it into the channel somehow. So the way we do it is that, you know, like we first sparsify and then project it into this low dimension channel bandwidth. So in a way I'm doing this kind of compressive sensing type of uh, projection, some pseudo random linear projection. And then I transmit this projected vector uncoded. And I'm assuming that all the devices are synchronized. So all these kind of analog projected uh, vectors are going to be superposed over the channel. So if you think about without the projection, basically I'm just taking the, my, my local vector, transmitting over the channel. Everybody does the same. The channel adds them all. And that's what the, the, the parameter service is interested in anyway. Right? So this basically, uh, what, we, what you can call is this over the air computation. So you're exploiting the interference uh, aspect of the wireless channel to do the computation for you. And moreover, with this uh, uh, projection, uh, we are also we are, we are basically doing uh, some compression, uh, analog compression. And uh, so it turns out that it's, of course, not surprising, it does really well. So here, for example, if you look at, you know, this is the black curve is what you would get without error-free shared link. And the analog performance is so much better, you know, it's almost there and much better than the digital approach. Digital approach is basically you compress and then send. And, and this is the case when, you know, this is for IID data, even for the non-IID data, where you would expect actually this sparsity patterns are going to be different, so that might cause a problem, but not really. And it turns out, you know, even there, we are getting basically very, very good results uh, with this analog uh, transmission. Finis, yes. a question? Sure. Hey, I, uh, in, in this, in what you just showed us, uh, don't we care about, you know, they might have different channel gains, so... Yes, you're, added, okay. so you're adding will, over will, the air. Yeah. Okay. This, is, this is the slide here. <laughs> okay, away. so it was, okay. yeah, that was just to kind of, you know, like to, to introduce the Motivate. idea. Motivate, okay. So, yeah, the wire. But, but basically, yeah, so the, the challenge in the, the, the fading case, now what you want, you want to make sure that, you know, because since you want them to add, so if, if you know, you want to somehow, you know, cancel the effect of the channel fading. So we use channel inversion, truncated channel inversion. So if, if, if it's too bad, you don't transmit. Your channel is too bad, you don't transmit. But if it's not, then you just invert it. So in a way, you just, you know, cancel the effect. So it still, you know, like still works uh, uh, pretty good. And again, much, much better than the digital approach. Uh, Okay, so I will give you know like kind of some variations without going into too much detail of, of this idea. So here again, so we are uh, in in all these you know we are assuming that you can transmit analog symbols, but you know like uh, 
you can argue that, but you know, in practice, at least with today's devices, I can't really send, you know, like this, this would require infinite constellation, but typically these devices are, you know, limited to transmit some finite constellation. So for that, we said, okay, so let's just look at, uh, because we know that, for example, the sine SGD, right? So if you just do single bit quantization of your gradient vectors, that's sufficient to learn a uh, pretty good model. So why not do this, right? So we, we did basically just take the sine SGD and then now send these, you know, like bits using just BPSK, or you can just combine pairs and send QPSK, that's also fine. And, and basically now what we are doing is instead of, you know, over the air computation, we are actually doing over the air majority voting, right? Because you just take, you know, maybe some users say plus one, some plus uh, minus one, and then you would take the majority and then push the gradient on that uh, direction. And it turns out, yeah, it works, you know, like pretty good. Uh, in general, so here I combine this one is com comparing with the you know the digital scheme, the full analog scheme, and the proposed scheme is it's pretty much you know uh, there's almost you know like very little loss, uh, and yeah, so we also looked at you know what happens with fading with imperfect CSI. Even in those cases, uh, it's fine, and and another finally I want to mention is the so what if you don't have channel state information? Right, because in the other cases we kind of assume perfect channel state information to kind of cancel out the effect of fading. For that, we basically introduce just multiple antennas at the receiver, and it turns out that that's also you know that helps. Uh, so we we assume actual channel state information at the receiver, but but even for that, all you need is actually the the sum of the the, the channel gains. So that might also save a little bit uh, in terms of channel estimation at the receiver. And you can see that basically, you know, if you have sufficiently many number of antennas, you are getting, you know, like very close to, uh, to the baseline uh, performance. And I want to finish with something that, you know, we have, we've been looking at uh, recently, which is some work I, I like. So the idea here is, uh, again, very similar to the previous work. So it was always kind of, you know, like that we need to put channel into our, you know, machine learning paradigm. So we looked at also reinforcement learning. So the idea is that, okay, so in reinforcement learning, I have an agent, you know, learning from the environment, but what if, you know, the, the kind of, uh, the person who observes the state and the rewards is not the one taking the actions and actually now there's a wireless channel. So this is, this is a nice problem because it kind of uh, puts together all this, you know, uh, coding and it's, it's also sort of a, uh, so you're designing a code, but the code not for the purpose of just, you know, minimizing the error probability, but, you know, doing actions. So in a way, this is, you know, control with communication constraints uh, type of problem. And yeah, so we, we also looked at the, this uh, uh, problem where, you know, you can actually, you can use a, a channel code uh, to send the right actions, or you can design the whole thing together. And not surprisingly, <laughs> it's better to, to do the design together. And yeah, you can gain in terms of uh, the average reward also in this type of problem. Okay, so I think uh, I'm already uh, uh, quite uh, late. Uh, I would like to leave some time also for uh, questions if, if, if you want to, uh, if you have the time. So I guess, yeah, I can conclude with uh, kind of re-emphasizing the, the main message that, you know, if you want to do bring intelligence to the edge over wireless channels, uh, we better, you know, take that wireless channel really into account when we design also while designing the, the machine learning algorithms.